Hey, what's going on, everybody? I'd like, to thank you all for tuning into the show this week. About to switch things up a little bit. Uh, right now, with me, I have a very special guest. Uh, as you know, we usually talk about sports, but this guy's making a big name for himself out there right now, out there hustling hard. Had to get him on the show just to talk to him about what's going on with the black community and everything right now. Uh, so I only have, it's only right that I have with me Philadelphia's own Prince of Pan Africanism, Dr. Umar Johnson. Doc, how you doing? All is well, my brother. Thanks for having me on the show. All right, baby. You ready to get into this work? Yes, sir. All right. First thing I have for you, man, uh, it's obviously pe the people that know you, uh, you're a school psychologist. You work uh, a lot with our youth. Uh, just with working with our youth, man, what are some of the common disorders or mental uh, illnesses or just problems that you see uh, when you go to evaluate our black youth? I would say that the biggest problem that I find and working with our children in my capacity as a school psychologist is the very low, or should I say the relatively low estimation that teachers and parents have for their ability to learn or behave themselves. It is amazing to see how many young brothers in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, who are being sent to me and to colleagues of mine to be evaluated for assumed learning disabilities, assumed uh, intellectual disabilities, assumed ADHD. It's just amazing how quick black parents are willing to push the special ed button, the disability button, the psychiatric medication button. Now, looking at the teachers who are responsible for educating our children, i.e. middle-class white women, I would expect that behavior from them because they come from a four centuries old legacy based off of the belief in African racial inferiority. So I understand that the white woman is coming from a custom that posits that black people are intellectually inferior to white folks. So I can understand, although it's not acceptable, I can understand why the white teacher feels the black boy has a learning disability. I can understand why the white principal feels the black boy needs medicine to control his behavior boy is an animal. You know, he can only be controlled through external mechanisms. So the white teachers and the white principals are doing what they're supposed to do according right. to their racial agenda. Right. We're doing what we need to do according to our racial agenda. Problem is the lack of confidence everyone has when it comes to black children in general and black boys in particular as it relates to academic aptitude and behavioral control. Right. Now, so sure to Doc, man, what's the prescription? Uh, how do we solve that problem? Well, here's the, here's the thing. We have to be very clear that a is not the same as a Band-Aid. And that has to be stated because my Douglas once said that too often we strike at the branches in addressing our problems but very rarely do we strike at the root. And if we look at the miseducation machine, and I refer to it as a machine because it is heartless, it is emotionless, it does not care, it is absolutely about the destruction of the intelligence of black children. And when we look at this, it, it, it's very obvious. And that solution is to build independent schools for black children. That's the solution. A solution is something that once implemented is designed to eliminate the problem forever. Solutions are permanent. Yeah. Band-aids are temporary. Charter school is a band-aid. Homeschool is a band-aid. Voucher special ed is a band-aid. Discipline school is a band-aid. Prison is a band-aid. The solution is independent schools. All right. And the problem with that solution solution for the black community is that we as a people are not ready to sacrifice financially for our own liberation. Let me say that one more time. As a people, you say, what is the common hardcore challenge that faces us as we move into the next year of the 21st century and as we move two years closer to the quadricentennial of black oppression in America? August of 1619 to August of 2019, 100 years. And I'm quite certain our ancestors are not happy or comfortable 
with the lack of progress we've made over these 400 years. But we're not ready to sacrifice financially for our own liberation. And that right there is our problem. And that right there is the primary reason why I'm building the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy. Destroy, condemn, and exterminate the mind. We cannot do this ourselves. All right. Now, you were just talking about the uh, race that's uh, going on in the schools that's affecting our youth. Uh, if I'm correct, uh, you got two daughters, right? Yes, sir. All right. Just with uh, to the parents out there that's listening, man, what age do you think is a good age for uh, the kids to uh, have a discussion with them just about racism and white supremacy? Uh, that's going on in the country right now. Cause I've talked to a lot of people, you know, they have daughters, you know, going through school, man. I ask them or, you know, sons or whatever. And I ask them, I say, Hey, man, uh, you know, they, some, uh, another person just got killed with a cop. You talk to the kids yet? Or, Oh, well, you know, no, nah, my brother, man, I don't think they old enough yet or such and such. Uh, just what age do you think is just a good age for them to just have a discussion about the, uh, youth about just what's going on with our youth, uh, our elders and whatever that's going on in the community right now in terms of race. I would say that once your child knew and what racism is, that's when it's time for you to educate them about racism. In other words, a child comes home and says, the, the teacher excluded me from an activity because I'm black or one of my white classmates made a racial joke or, or I think I'm being picked on a singled out because I'm darker than the other children. Once your child expresses any elementary type of understanding or consciousness about racial differences, that means they're old enough to start learning about the racism. You know, it's the same answer I have when people ask me, what is the appropriate age to teach my child about? sexuality as it relates to the LBGT crusade. And my answer is the same thing. Once your child comes home speaking to the fact that they're being educated about men being with men or women being with women or whatever the case may be, once they express to you any type of confusion or interest or understanding in that subject matter, it is now appropriate for you to educate them about that particular circumstance. Because they are targeting our children at younger and younger ages. Yeah. And if a black boy is old enough to be victimized by racism, he's old enough to learn about racism. That's right. Uh, Doc, if you can, man, just what are your thoughts on uh, my generation uh, right now, the millennials? I think the millennials could be our worst curse or our greatest blessing. Obviously, we'll consider Millennials, as many of them adopt a post-racial attitude, uh, many of them are multiculturalists. They're caught up in a lot of struggles that are not essential to the black predicament: feminism, uh, LBGTism, multiculturalism, anything but focusing upon the blackness. Yeah. So that's the big issue I got. They've been multiculturalized out of common sense. So that's one of my biggest challenges uh, for the millennials. But on the other side of that. I see the brilliance and the intelligence of the millennials, the ideas that they come up with. You know, they're very sharp. And so if we can get them to a channel intelligence and that creative genius into racially progressive activities and racially progressive conversations, I think our millennials can do us a lot of good. See, the millennials are the first grandchildren in America whose grandparents or parents did not go through any of the civil rights struggle or black power struggle. Mm -hmm. So for me, my grandmother lived through that time. My mother was a bit too young, but my grandmother lived through that time. For the millennials, they don't really have a grandparent who could sit them down and say, hey, let me tell you what it was like in this country 50 years ago. Yeah. You know, they, a lot of them don't have that. And because of that, we have failed to pass on the legacy of struggle and cultural consciousness to the millennial generation. So the way that they are in terms of being disconnected from the racial is largely the responsibility of the black community itself, but it's not too late. We can still bring them into that consciousness. All right. 
Now it's about time to get right into FDMG, Frederick Douglass, Marcus Garvey Academy. Uh, just any further updates on that, Doc? Well, right now, you know, that's the reason I'm in Detroit. I just came from Wilmington, and the day before yesterday, I was in Atlanta, uh, all school shopping, still school shopping. Right now, it looks like it's going to be a toss-up between Atlanta and Detroit. Wilmington, Delaware is still a very real possibility. Okay. It's still a very real possibility. Uh, but Atlanta and Detroit, I would say maybe edging Wilmington slightly, but Wilmington is still a possibility. I think it's going to come down to a school in one of those three cities. And the decision is based on the school itself, not the location. Okay. So it's not about whether I want to be in Detroit versus Atlanta. That has absolutely nothing to do with my decision. It just so happens that Atlanta and Detroit are two very strong Dr. Umar support cities. Yeah. You know, that worked out as a coincidence, and I'm glad it did. But that had nothing to do with it. I'm totally focused on the facility itself, which is to say I could put the school in Little Rock, Arkansas, or Phoenix, Arizona, or Milwaukee, Wisconsin, as much as I would put it in Detroit or Atlanta, because it's about what what do we get for the money that we have. Yeah. You know, so that, that's what I'm looking at, facilities over locations. So it's not about loyalty to one city. It's about loyalty to the best possible opportunity we can give our children with the $700,000 that the people have given me. Yeah. And it's just good to hear, man, that you'll be having it uh, pretty close to me, man, because just uh, right where I'm at, dude, like the school's been shutting down like crazy. You know, I stay in a predominantly black area. So like, you know, you see a lot of these kids you know, with the school's shutting down. A lot of them don't really have any hope or any direction or anything like that. Uh, just, man, that'd be really uh, helpful for you to uh, have that school Definitely. up here for them to go to. So, yeah, I'm really hoping, man, that you can have it up here, man. That'll be just fantastic for the youth. Now, tell me, uh, just what's so special about, going to be so special about FDMG Academy, man? Like I said, you kind of touched on with the whole public schools, charter schools, and um, private schools. you got some black people out here homeschooling their kids and so forth. Uh, just what's just so special about FDMG Academy? Why should parents just send their kids to your school? It's a school that doesn't have the same uh, ideological premise as every other school. Most schools exist to teach black children how to work for white folks, or either they exist to prepare the children to go to college and then go work for white folks. Yeah. Our premise is economic and political and intellectual independence. So we are empowering our boys to create their own political economic reality. We're not indoctrinating them with an American consciousness. We're not indoctrinating them with the belief that going to college is somehow going to solve all your problems when in fact it's creating more problems for a lot of black folk when you look at the unemployment rate for college educated black folks. We want to stand that their livelihood is their own responsibility, that you don't necessarily have to go to college to become wealthy or successful that that is simply a uh, narrative that has been pushed by the colleges and the government to put black people into debt in the name of higher education. And we're, we're definitely not against college because I'm sure most of our children will probably end up going because many of them are going to want to make a, a, a headway for their community by studying you know, that is critically important for us. So some of them are going to want to be engineers, doctors, educators, psychologists, you know, pharmacists, those types of careers require collegiate education, and they will be more than prepared for that. But for other children who are not necessarily interested in a career that requires a degree, they should not be forced to go to college. I know plumbers who make as much money as surgeons. I know electricians who make as much money as scientists. I know carpenters, engineers. So we have to break down that those who go to college make more money than those who don't. I know very successful black men and black women who are in the industrial building trades who live quite well and do quite well. And so I want to make sure our children are aware of all the different opportunities that are available to them as they choose their life path, as opposed to being bullied into thinking that you have to go to college. You know, So that's one of our biggest differences. We're also going to teach a strong, strong diet 
of African spirituality, uh, ancestral veneration, uh, Pan-Africanism is going to be the foundation and not just any type of Pan-Africanism, but Marcus Garvey's Pan-Africanism. We're going to be quite serious about that. They will understand that. Economic science, they will understand that. They will be doing business plans in elementary school. They will be doing financial plans in elementary school. We're going to give them as much as it is possible for them to be able to handle in those years while they are with us. We're going to start with the K-8 to Academy or a particular subsection of K-8, to probably more like third to seventh. And of course, finances will dictate that. But we ultimately hope to grow in, 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 in our final analysis will be a K through 12 school. Ultimately, that's what we're looking at. But I would say that when your child comes to the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, they're going to get an experience that they will never get at any other school, including other uh, independent African schools. One thing that, you know, is really going to separate my school, among other things, the curriculum is radically different. The ideology is radically different. The mission is radically different, but also the founder and the principal, which is myself, I come with credentials that a lot of principals of independent African schools don't have. I've been a principal of a regular school. I am a certified school principal. You know, I have degrees in educational leadership. So, you know, I'm coming to the table not as an experimenter. You know, a lot of times brothers and sisters will open up. There's nothing wrong with being an experimenter, learning as you grow. A lot of us have gotten very good at what we do by experimenting. But I'm not an experimenter. I'm a seasoned veteran. You know, and, and, and I'm going to bring that repertoire to the table. But more than the credentials, more than that is the commitment and the strong revolutionary Pan-Africanist ethos that I'm going to bring to that school. It'll be like nothing we've ever seen. And that's why I call it heaven on earth. All right. Now, what has been the hardest uh, part of your journey uh, with opening up this uh, FDMG Academy? The hardest part has also been the most gratifying part and that is the money and I, I say that to say that it's been gratifying to see that we've gotten tens of thousands of donations over these past three years that nearly every donor who has ever donated to the FDMG fund has been a repeat donor yeah. nearly every to donate again and many of my donors donate on a regular basis so you know, that speaks to their commitment. That speaks to, you know, the faith that they have in me and reading the letters and the emails and the tweets and the text messages that I get. You know, it just keeps me motivated to do what it is I need to do. So the money has been gratifying to see how selflessly so many brothers and sisters in our community have been willing to give to me. Um, on the other side, the money has also been, you know, a a minor disappointment in the fact that more people, not the ones who have donated, I don't ask anything extra of the ones who have given, but for the ones who have given, but who are out here spending, you know, millions of dollars on hair, sneakers and technological devices. Just it's just Black a shame. Friday. Exactly. It's yeah. just, right now we're in the middle of, you know, the biggest shopping frenzy of the year for black folks. And we're going to yeah. dump billions of dollars into a white economy while the black economy is gasping for air, you know, and it just hurts that our children are catching the hell that they're catching, but yet their parents care more about useless garbage that they're going to buy for Christmas as opposed to building the type of school, you know, that our children need. I look at Darren Wilson and when he murdered our brother, uh, Michael Brown, and I look at you know, uh, George Zimmerman and when he murdered our brother Trayvon Martin. And I look at some of these other police officers who have been guilty of fascinating unarmed black people. You know, white folks have come together to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for them in a single day. Yeah. In a single day, they were able to raise money to defend the killers of black people. You know, so although I'm very much thankful to those who have donated, you know, I'm very gracious for what they've done for me to help me get to this point where in the next couple of weeks we should have school god willing at the same time it hurts because so many more should have donated did not donate but i do have to be cautious in stating that i do believe that part of the reason why we haven't gotten more donations is because simply put a lot of people don't know about dr umar johnson or the fdmg academy fund yeah 
millions of black people know me. You know, I can't walk outside anymore and not be known. Like everywhere I go, they know me. Um, I just came from eating at Detroit Soul Restaurant. The brothers and sisters knew me so when I walked in the door. But there's still millions more who don't. And so what I always try to do is just encourage brothers and sisters who have donated and who support me to tell people in your family, tell your coworkers, tell people at your church, your magic, your fraternity, your sorority. Just tell them, oh, go look him up, I'm trying to raise money for a school, and you have to make a donation. I think that right there is the single most powerful thing we can do to bring more people into the consciousness of what I am about. All right. Okay, up next, we're about to switch the uh, tone just a little bit. Uh, we're about to talk about a little bit more about uh, racism and just white supremacy. Uh, recently just had uh, women come out about their Me Too movement. Uh, you know, talking about them being sexually assaulted and stuff. And, uh, just black people have been constantly going through hell, um, in this country, Doc. I was just wondering, man, um, if you wouldn't mind sharing with the, uh, people just a personal story that may have affected you that you've dealt with, uh, with racism that you've dealt with in the past. If you wouldn't mind talking to the people about it. I think of a recent example, it would have to be my doctoral education. Uh, I- uh, we just lost Umar for a second. Uh, we're back at him, but go back with your story. The racism that I went through working on my doctorate degree, yes, the most excruciating form of racism that I experienced was working on my doctoral degree, a eight year program that should have all years, which was consistently sabotaged by the white professors who ran that program. Uh, that experience really helped me rededicate myself to fighting against in the lives of our children by having to go through it myself uh, within the field of education. Uh, going through that in my 30s could only help me understand how painful it must be to go through that as a child. Um, it was emotionally traumatizing, my experience with racism working on my doctoral degree. And if that can bother me in my 30s, I'm quite certain it can bother a child at seven or 14. And so just going through that was almost like a rebaptism into the school to prison pipeline. And, you know, for me, that would probably be the single greatest example of racism with thus far in my life. All right. Uh, now we're about to get right back on racism in a minute, but, uh, one thing I'd like to just touch on real quick is just cooning. Uh, we got a lot of people, um, our own community that's holding us back just by cooning, man. Um, just how much do you think cooning, uh, has just held us back as a people and, uh, just how bad it is right now? And is there really any way to just get black people on code, uh, at the moment? No, it's going to be very difficult to get black people on code. This is why we need schools to re-socialize our children. Cooning has become the new black. And the reason cooning has become the new black is because black children are not raised by anybody to be loyal to black people. Absolutely not at all. When we saw the situation, you know, the reason why he was not supported by his fellow black athletes is because they were not raised, many of them who taught them to value black liberation above and beyond of financial comfortability. So it was easy. It was easy for Deion Sanders. It was easy for Jalen Rose. It was easy for all these black celebrities to act like they didn't understand why Colin Kaepernick chose to take a knee. They knew exactly why Colin Kaepernick chose to take a knee, but they did not have the same type of honor and commitment to black people to support what that brother did. They paid respect to a flag than they did to the lives of black men and black women. And so for me, we have to stop raising our children with a get rich or die trying mentality. As long as we raise our children with a get rich or die trying mentality, we will never fix this situation because money, money has replaced loyalty. Money has replaced integrity. Money has replaced honor and respect in the black community. All of our kids, are being raised with a very sick and unhealthy addiction and attraction to materialism. It's about wealth. It's about money. It's about bling, bling culture. And in that type of a pursuit, 
looking out for your people is irrelevant. It's all about looking out for self. And I think black people are greater capitalists than white people ever could be. We're mm-hmm. greater capitalists because all the white people are capitalists. Commitment to their community. Yes, they are selfish, but at the same time, you have never seen white folks sell out their community for another. They don't do it. Yeah. They, as selfish as they are, they do not sell out their own community for another group. Black people will sell out black people for any group, any group under the sun. Yeah. There is no code because there is no collective consciousness. And there is no collective consciousness because we are in an identity crisis. Most black people don't want to be black in the first place. And something that isn't worth fighting for definitely cannot be saved. Yeah. You know, that's one thing I will say this, uh, you know, we, we do a lot of talk about a lot of sports on this podcast. Um, I knew a lot of black people weren't going to be with, uh, Kaepernick on the whole, uh, NFL issue, but it just surprised me at just how quick it got shut down. Like, I honestly, I thought it could last a year. I did. But just how quick, uh, that thing just got shut down. Just like week after week, we saw less people kneeling and, uh, just, uh, coming together, uh, for Colin Kaepernick. I, I was really surprised by that. I, I thought they could at least last it a year, but. But you see, when, when, when you're raised to value sports more than anything else. True. Then nothing else is going to matter. Yeah. And basically what black football players have said is, me playing this game or me talking on television about this game in the case of the commentators is more important than black people's life and safety. That is more important. You know, as a man is taught, so is his thoughts. Yeah. And so much of this goes back to how we raise our children, the principles we give them to live by, the morals we give them to live by. It is not conducive to the best interests of black folks. You know, we are the ultimate individualist people. We are totally individual. Black folks, when they make a decision, there's one thing that you can be guaranteed never enters their mind as it relates to their decisions, and that is how it affects other black people. To the contrary, Chinese have to consider the impact on the culture. Jews have to consider the impact on the culture. Mexicans have to consider the impact on the culture. East Indians, Arabs have to consider the impact of their decisions on their culture. Black people, absolutely not. Yeah, that's correct, man. Now, another thing I'd like to touch on is just reparations uh, for black people. Um, Do you believe that, well, first of all, how confident are you that black people will get reparations? And just uh, how, uh, let's see, yeah, how confident are you that black people can get reparations? Um... And just what should the reparations consist of? Should it just be money? Should it be money and land? Like, what do? What's your personal opinion on that? Black people can get reparations. The problem is, what is needed in order to get reparations, black folks are not willing to do. So, number one, in order to get reparations, you have to disidentify from being an American. No country gives reparations citizens. Reparations are generally given to nations of people. So black people are going to have to stop identifying with the American power structure and recognize that they are prisoners of war before they're going to be given reparations. And that's something black people are not going to do because we are too insecure about our identity. Too insecure. And the reason we're so insecure about our identity is because we know that we're not American. Yeah, But we keep on trying to convince everybody that we are. We know we're not, but we, we keep on trying to convince everybody that we are. And that's due to the fact that we don't want to be who we really are, and that's Africans. Yeah. We don't ever want to be told we're African. One of the greatest insults is to tell a Negro that you are from Africa. He will hate you for that. He wants nothing to do with Africa. And that's why our identity complex plays into every problem we got. Yeah, One of the biggest reasons we can't unify is because black folks are too busy trying to be something other than black and, and, and trying to be accepted by people who are not black. You know, so it's, it, hate has taken on a whole new 21st century personality. And I would go on record as stating that the self hate that we deal with now, I believe, is the worst type of self hate that has ever existed in black America since the beginning of the British North American slave trade in 1619. 
Mm. I believe we are the worst psychologically that our race has produced in this country. Wow. Now this is about the Y2K comb. Yeah. That's awful. Now, this is go right into politics. Uh, we're about to get on Trump in a minute. But um, anybody that listened to your lectures before, uh, notice you're not really a fan of uh, Obama um, and what he's done uh, politically for the black community. Uh, just to ask you about Obama, um, because a lot of black people still, you know, I don't care how old they are or whatever. They don't really understand racism. They don't understand white supremacy. Do you think Obama knowingly did what he did, or do you think he just came into the office and he didn't really know what he was uh, going to get into? I think it was both. Uh, he never held the office before, so he didn't act exactly know what he was inheriting in that position. But at the same time, Barack Obama, like all other presidents, come to learn during the course of their four or eight years in office that I do have the ability to make certain things happen on the domestic front for certain groups of people. Obama quite clearly knew this because his presidency was basically the presidency for homosexual America. He fought and basically cajoled the entire country into accepting uh he, he equated homosexuality with black freedom. Uh, he gave the homosexuals a, a, a Supreme Court justice. They got three, at least three major federal laws. Uh, they got the Don't Act, Don't Tell repealed in the military. They got over 200 federally appointed jobs. Barack Obama did in four years what America still hasn't done for black people in 400. So if you can take care of one minority group, you can damn sure take care of another minority group. And how dare you take care of a group whose issues don't even begin to approach the types of problems that members of your community have to deal with, i.e. Africans in America. And if Obama did not look out for any minority groups, that would have been to his benefit, because then he could say that I'm only looking out for America. No, most Americans are not gay. So you can't say that he was looking out for America by looking out for gays because most Americans are not gay. I didn't benefit at all from any of those gay laws. No heterosexual benefited from any of those gay laws. Those laws were just for gay people. So if you can pass laws just for gay people, you can pass laws just for black people. But I will say this. In his defense, or that he would do a single thing to help black people. So I do have to be fair. He's not a hypocrite. He's not a hypocrite because he never said he would do. He's just a sellout because he didn't do. Yeah. But he, he's not a hypocrite because he never said that he would do. I didn't expect him to do anything. I knew he wouldn't do anything because black people didn't ex- ask him to. If I'm going to be supported and treated like a hero, and I don't have to risk my relationship with white folks to do it, why change it? If yeah. black people are going to see me as some sort of godsend, and I've done absolutely nothing for them. Why would I change? I remember when Obama ran for office, both terms. He was asked, why was he avoiding the African-American community? He was asking for white interviewers. They said, we noticed that when you go on tour, you kind of avoid black neighborhoods. And Obama's answer was, I already have their vote. So there's no need for me to pay attention. This is, And I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said, I already have their vote. So there's really no need to pay attention to them. And this was in the Associated Press. So he basically took black people for granted because we like to be taken for granted. And whoever runs for the Democratic ticket in the next election, they're going to take black people for granted, too. Yeah. And it's a political immaturity that we have yet to outgrow. We have this sick approach to politics that says, I have to like you in order to vote for you. That means for us, politics is about personal relationships. And that is very bad. Why? Because politics has nothing to do with relationships. Politics is about the business of the redistribution of wealth and resources. Politics is about the business of the redistribution of wealth and resources. I do not have to like you to be in business with you. 
I do not have to like you to make you do right by me. I do not have to like you to support you. If in supporting you, I am able to achieve my objectives, then I will vote for a white man as soon as I vote for a black man. Because what I need is not a black face. What I'm in need of is black power. Yeah. Now, uh, after Obama, we obviously got Trump. We had a lot of black people that were uh, very disappointed in that, still expressing their disappointment. Uh, and they got the Not My President movement um, and everything. But just uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Trump so far in office? Donald Trump was the white man's reparations for having to deal with eight years of Barack Obama. Donald Trump was the white man's reparations for having to deal with eight years of Barack Obama. See, this, most white America is not rich. Most white America is not financially comfortable. Most white America is poor or working class. The only privilege that a poor white person has in America is the privilege to always be treated better and valued more than black people. When they put Barack Obama in the White House, that hurt the ego of poor and working class white folks because the one thing that they had, which is the privilege of being white, they felt was jeopardized by putting the so-called most powerful man in America in the White House. Yeah. And because poor white people had to suffer for eight long years of not being the obvious, the obvious beneficiary of privilege, they had to be compensated for that. And Donald Trump was the reparations for that compensation. Yeah. Kind of makes me think of, if uh, Obama was never elected. Donald Trump would not be president today. Wow. I guarantee, I, I can promise you. If Barack Obama was never president, Donald Trump would have never been president either. Only an unexpected Obama election could produce an unexpected Trump election. Wow. And there's something to be learned from this because black people have a bad habit of celebrating victories that have not even been achieved. I give you an example. In 1954, the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision outlawed the use of race in the school system. Black people celebrated, although the schools today are just as segregated as they were 53 years ago. Now, 20 years later in 1974, the United States Supreme Court, the same court, the same court 20 years later, ruled in a case known as Milliken versus Bradley that you cannot force school districts to integrate across district lines. That means if Detroit Public Schools is 99% black and this is integrated schools, that means Detroit is going to have to go to White Wedford or any of the other white town to integrate the students because there's no white kids to in Detroit to integrate. And the Supreme Court said you cannot force Across the state line. Wow. Black school districts, okay, were racially exclusive throughout the entire district. If you want white kids, you got to go where? To another district to get them. And the Supreme Court said you can't do that. So although black people celebrated Brown as a victory, it was neutralized in, in 1974. Black people celebrated Barack Obama as a victory. He was also neutralized with the Donald Trump election. See, we have to stop being impatient, so thirsty for artificial victory that we grasp at anything and treat it like some sort of momentous occasion. When the truth of the matter is, in the overall scheme of things, what was the practical, political, economic benefit to black people of the Barack Obama administration? That is the question. Yeah. Take the emotions out of it. Take the religious fervor out of it. He's gone now. He's been gone for almost a year. What has been the political economic benefit of eight years of Barack Obama? Absolutely nothing. Yeah. Absolutely nothing for black America. 
Let me ask you too. Uh, when Trump got elected, uh, there was this whole issue with people saying, "Oh, well, you know, Russia they affected the um, election," and uh, I think there's something else uh, Russia was doing. Uh, I think they was doing with the uh, so-called black identity extremists or whatever. Um, just what were your whole thoughts about uh, when they were saying just Russia affecting the election um, and whatnot? I can guarantee that Russia had absolutely nothing to do with the United States election. Not, first of all, we don't choose presidents. Electoral College does that. Yeah. And Russia does not control the Electoral College or anyone within it. White power controls the Electoral College. That is nothing but propaganda put out there by the National Security Association the Bilderbergs, the Trilaterals, the Federal Reserve, the white power structure of America to make people think that the powers that be did not want Donald Trump. Yeah. The truth of the matter is that they chose Donald Trump. You don't get to be president unless the power structure approves you. But the media is being used to preach a narrative that Donald Trump was not the choice of America, when he most absolutely was. He was the choice of white people. And he was the choice of white power. And that's why he's in there. If anything, Barack Obama was not the choice of white America. When Barack Obama beat Senator McCain his first term, he beat Senator McCain by less than 3 million votes. He beat Senator McCain by the size of Delaware, which is one of the smallest states in America. That's all. He barely beat him. But it was treated like a landslide. It was a landslide in the Electoral College. It was not a landslide in a popular vote. More than half, or should I say at least half of America, did not want Barack Obama, but white pop. Obama. And that's why he got in there. The National Security Association, absolutely everything, as it relates to a presidential candidate, a serious one. So there's no way in heaven that Donald Trump could have had the election manipulated by Russia. It's absolutely impossible. Yeah, this uh, like the key and thing. As far as the uh, black identity extremism, yeah. that's also a manipulation. That is FBI and CIA who have been watching individuals like me, and probably because I teach. I think that that is something that they contrived of, and they took a page right out of their 1960s book. In the 1960s, any black activist, any nationalist was automatically presumed to be a communist. Whether it was Patrice Lumumba, Kwame Ture, King, they are communists. The communists are funding them. The communists are putting them up to it. So they're doing the same thing again. Yeah. Russia is funding black identity in the United States. Absolute nonsense. White Russians are just as racist as white Americans. They're not funding anybody. That was a narrative cooked up and fabricated by the FBI because they're beginning to cre- to create the context for the next COINTELPRO operation. Yeah, because uh, like just me kind of just thinking about it, like the two major um, elections that people thought were iffy was during my time. Uh, you know, I'm a 90s guy, so I was growing up when uh, what happened with between Bush and Gore and then uh, kind of like with Hillary and uh, Trump. You know, just with uh, how the uh, elections went with the public and then the Electoral College and stuff. So it's kind of how it is. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Another thing I'd like to touch on uh, right now is if you obviously if you're watching the news, I don't care if it's Fox, CNN or whatever. Uh, you know that Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un is uh, beefing right now uh, with pressing them possibly going to war. Uh, if North Korea gets in this, obviously, you know, that big brother China is going to step in. Uh, we talk about white supremacy a lot, but how big of a threat is Chinese supremacy or Asian supremacy uh, to black people? Um, if this was a, if a war was to break down or whatnot. China is the world's superpower already. The white man considers himself the world's superpower because that's just his narcissism. China has been the world's superpower at least for the past 10 years, at least. China, the power of China far exceeds the power of the United States or Great Britain. 
although they control so much of the minerals of the world, because China was not a colonizer of Africa. Through technology and manufacturing, China has been able to balance out the scales. And now in post-colonial Africa and the Caribbean islands, where China is really increasing its presence through building relationships with African leaders and Caribbean and such as South American leaders, it could be argued that even when we deal with the resources of black countries, China is almost is almost as resourceful in Africa as is the United States and the United Kingdom and France. Wow. So they don't know what to do with China. They got more people. They got more money. They got more technology. They got a bigger military. White supremacy cannot be China. And their problem with North Korea is the fact that North Korea will not allow America to use it as an Asian outpost from where it could launch missiles in a military offensive against China in case that war ever took place. You see, the world is real simple to understand. The world is ran just like any ghetto. The world is ran just like you got your, 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 you got your, you know, your players, you know, your ballers, the kingpins. America is a kingpin. Britain is a kingpin. Is a kingpin. And they basically, world, listen, we going to do what we want to do, when we want to do it, how, how we want to do it. And you're going to do what we tell you to do. And by the way, we're about to have weapons on this planet, weapons of mass, nuclear weapons. Uh, if you ain't white, you have a nuclear weapon in this. But Kim Jong-un said, I'm going to have a nuclear weapon. And you have a nuclear weapon because only with a nuclear weapon, be sure that you never try. Under the false discussion. I'm at destruction, or whatever the case may be. So I'm with destruction. So that way, the only way to keep the bully off of you is to have what? The same weapon that the bully got. See, the reason why Africa is getting dominated, Africa ain't got no nuclear weapons. Yeah. Russia has a nuclear weapon, I believe. Uh, North Korea working on one. Countries with nuclear weapons are the only countries that can keep America, France, and the UK from bullying them around. That you need to get a nuclear weapon. That's why they killed Gaddafi. Yeah. Yeah, let's uh, touch on Africa right now, man. Uh, one of the key things, uh, you know, you just said uh, Gaddafi. Uh, we're about to talk about Libya and Zimbabwe. Um, but you can touch on the other, uh, any other countries in Africa if you want. But one kind of thing that really opened my uh, mind in politics, um, I believe when Barack Obama first got in office, I was, uh, I think about 15, 14, 15, something like that. And, uh, what I, I, you know, I was happy because I got folks from down south, Alabama, uh, you know, people tell me that, hey, you know, we weren't going to see a black president and everything. So I, I was happy to see one. Um, but one thing that really opened my eyes was, uh, when Gaddafi got killed over in Libya. You know, it's like all this talk about, oh, well, this guy's a dictator and he's evil and all that stuff. I'm like, OK, but y'all focus on Gaddafi. We getting black people getting their head blown off and everything over here. Like, what the hell? Like, what are we doing to stop that? Y'all worried about Libya. So that really opened my eyes um, to kind of very much about just politics and uh, what was going on in America. But um, if you can, man, just discuss Africa, you know, Libya, uh, Zimbabwe. What you th- thoughts is about just what's going on over there? As it relates to Libya, I do not believe that Muammar Gaddafi was working on a weapon of mass destruction. I simply believe that that was the CIA's pretext that was offered to the public to justify his assassination. Gaddafi was assassinated for working and planning with the sub-Saharan African heads of state, African Central Bank, that would be linked to the natural resources of the continent. With Africa being the richest continent on the planet, a central bank with monies linked to its own resources would have made African currency more valued on the than any other currency in the world. That was economic revolution. On top of that, they were planning to float their own telecommunications satellite in Africa. That would have put the 
Western companies out of business that, that would have lost not trillions of dollars for white companies with cell phones, cell phone use, cable tele- television, internet, and all types of other services in Africa, a country with almost uh, a trillion people on it. And so, excuse me, 800 billion people on the continent, if not a billion people. And so they could not allow Gaddafi to go ahead. And Gaddafi was not the brain behind that project. African leaders were the brains behind the project. Gaddafi had the material, the financial wealth, the resources to make it happen. Right, because he had the money to make it happen. And that's why he was assassinated. It wasn't over nuclear weapons. It was because it had central bank and that telecommunication, telecommunication satellite, which would have ultimately been worth more to Africa than any nuclear bomb. Now, the, tr- the slave trade. And I really would like to know whether Gaddafi was aware that Africans were being traded in Libya or whether this is something that they're claiming and after, and because I believe the trading was going on while he was alive, hmm. you know, but I'm not certain, and, and that's something that I'm going to have to do research on. Here's the situation with the slave trade in Libya. It's wrong. It needs to be stopped. The African heads of state just last week, I believe, had a conference to talk about the modern African slave trade. But he, this is not new. Nor was it a secret. The question that has to be asked is why is the Western media, who doesn't give a damn about Africa, why is the Western media putting a spotlight on slave trading in Libya, but they're not putting a spotlight on slave trading in other African, excuse me, in other Arab states that they know is going on? Saudi Arabia, why you ain't talking about that? This Africans being traded into slavery in Kuwait. Why you ain't talking about that? This Africans being uh, traded into slavery in a lot of Arab states. You know why they're not being talked about? Because they, they are of the United States. The only reason why they're highlighting the slave trading in Libya, which and are just now talking about it, because Libya is considered an enemy state. It's an enemy state. So since it's an enemy state, we want to do all that we can to polarize its image so when we decide to invade Libya again, the world would be on our side because after all, they're trading Africans as slaves. Truth of the matter is, trading Africans as slaves is an Arab that's been going on for hundreds of years. It never stopped. And if America was serious or the UK was serious about doing something about this, they would target the whole so-called Western and North African world and not just one country. That's the hypocrisy. This is not one country. This is an entire enterprise that encompasses North Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. Yeah. Now, uh, just what are your thoughts about Zimbabwe? Uh, what happened with Mugabe? Robert Mugabe was thrown out of office because he was cutting deals with the Chinese. He was scheduled to start teaching Mandarin in the public school system uh, this public school year for uh, Zimbabwe. The Chinese had begun to make headways. Robert Mugabe, certain agreements had been signed between President Mugabe and the Chinese government. They were definitely coming to help out with the school system, and their language was soon was scheduled to soon be introduced into the curriculum. I believe, given Zimbabwe's wealth, given Zimbabwe's natural mineral resources, America could not allow for a country minerally rich in that particular part to fall to China especially given the fact that the Chinese have made so much headway into the Republic of South Africa. Had the Chinese been able to make headway into the uh, Republic of Zimbabwe, that would have given China a very strong presence 
in the southern horn of Africa. And that would have spelled disaster for American foreign policy. And so a coup had to be arranged, the Chinese incursion into Zimbabwe. And I believe that's why Robert Mugabe was overthrown. All right. Now we're about to uh, touch back uh, over here. Uh, I know you're in Detroit, man, but um, there's a city we got to touch on that's going through hell right now. um, And that's Flint. Uh, with their water crisis. Um, man, if you could just speak on it, just what are your thoughts on Flint and their whole situation going on with the water? Aside, one of the things that I find very, very interesting and tragic about the Flint crisis, speaker for Martin Luther King Day in Flint two years ago, my first and only visit, I'm looking to go back, but I'm Black leadership, whether it be black leadership in Michigan, black leadership in Flint, black leadership in America, I can't believe that up until now, there has not been a lawsuit for the residents of Flint to sue the state of Michigan and the city of Flint and the United States for knowingly allowing that type of toxicity in the drinking water causing those types of problems and potential problems. That is environmental genocide. If you read the United Nations Human Rights Convention definition of genocide, it is very clear. Any act, any act done deliberately that can to a people in whole or in part is the United States is guilty of people in Flint. And I can't believe that we still haven't seen an international law- lawsuit against government for the Flint water crisis. I think it speaks to the control that the black bourgeoisie has over black folks and the control that the white folks have over the black bourgeoisie. That should be an international situation. Yeah. The whole world should know about the Flint situation and it should be in the United Nations court. Yeah. That is, the reparations are due to them and at the at the bare minimum at the bare minimum the flint water crisis should be included as an aspect of the overall reparations fight that must be included in that fight because we are due reparations for that environmental holocaust yeah and it was just crazy uh especially with me man because there's a city uh literally right next to me uh it was, uh, Melania came up here and visited a, like a month or two back, but, uh, they had a situation with their water. It was something going on with their pipes. And like literally the next day, man, it got fixed. So, and this thing, this been going on for a year. So this is, uh, that's just absolutely ridiculous, man. What's going on over there? And speaking of Barack Obama, during that Flint water crisis, he didn't do anything about it. And, he actually went up and drank a glass of water. Now, you and I both know that that water vote on that news conference damn sure did not come out of no pipes of Flint. Yeah. If that was the case, he should have asked a resident to bring some of the water out of their home, out of their spigot, and he proved that he's confident that the government has eliminated the water conference. The water uh, crisis. He knew damn well he did. That was some Deer Park, Poland Spring, Fiji, some Brita water. Yeah. Obama didn't drink that water, but it goes to show what he's willing to do to prove his loyalty to the American power structure. Yeah. All right, now we're uh, getting ready to enter the year 2018. Uh, you know, this is about a time when people make. Uh, their New Year's resolution and stuff. Me, I'm a guy. I believe that if you got something that you need to do or fix, it should happen now. You shouldn't have to wait for a year. But this overall, Umar, just how uh, pleased are you with the black community in the year 2017? And what should be the black community's New Year's resolution for the 21A? Investment. And that should be our focus. Economic independence by way of investing in ourselves and building community. That should be our focus. 
See, racism affects black people to the extent that we are dependent upon it for our survival. If you don't need white hospitals to take care of you, then they can't kill you with their poor health. If you don't need white food to feed your kids, you don't have to worry about them. If you don't need white public schools to educate your kids, you don't have to worry about a school to prison pipeline. The reason racism affects black people so much is because are in need of very institutions in order to survive. You eliminate black white institutions. You reduce the level of influence that white racism has in the lives of black folk. But as long as we need them for our institutions, then we're going to continue to suffer at their hands. There's not a place in America where you can go at where you supermarket, a black school, and a black hospital in the same place. You can't name a city in black America, rural or municipal, where you will find a a hospital, a bank, and a school. In other words, of contained black community in the United States with the people who are on schedule to gross $2 trillion a year in spending power. That's what we do. $2 billion on Air Jordans last year. Liquor and alcohol last year. On the $650 million in fast food last year. $9 billion in perm last year. We bought twice the amount of Mercedes Benzes as white people, although they have twice the wealth of black folk. With all of that, spending power, making other people rich while you go broke, we don't have an independent institute. We don't have an independent for institutions anywhere in the United States. Absolutely unacceptable. Yeah. I can agree with that. Right now we're about to change it up a little bit. We're about to do a word association. Uh, kind of game, uh, Umar, I'm about to say a word or a phrase, and, uh, first thing that comes to your head, man, you just say, all right? Certainly. That's cool. All right, let's start it out. Uh, first word or phrase, Umar Johnson. Revolutionary. Liberal. Al Sharpton. <laughs> Marcus Garvey. Greatest black leader of the 20th century. Prison. The new slavery. White. Racism, narcissism, imperialism, and egoism. Black. Pride, power, persistence. Feminist movement. Child of white supremacy. Interracial relationships. Something I absolutely cannot stand. <laughs> Conscious community. Contradictions, contradictions, contradictions. Media. Informational warfare. Power. Concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. LGBT. Child of white supremacy. Pan-Africanism. Or perish. Hmm. Frederick Douglass. Greatest black leader of the 19th century. America. Why did God allow it to ever come into existence? Nigger. The worst 
that can ever be spoken from a human tongue. Conservative. Every coon in the black community. Obama. Travesty. Special education. The new eugenic movement. Donald Trump. Clown. Africa. For the Africans. Everybody else, get the hell out. Last but not least, FDMG. We'll be here sooner than you think. All right. Uh, now, just out of all those you said, like any ones that just stuck out to you or you would like to further elaborate on? Um, with the FDMG, I would say that I think the ancestors may have engineered the school to intentionally be delayed until August 21st, 29th. That's when they, so the start date will be 8 21 That's the quadricentennial of the black arrival under British North American rule in this country. Okay. And I think the ancestors may have set my path in such a way that the school opens on that very day so that we can receive their blessings as well. I think it's going to be something special when we get it done. The FDMG is not wherever it's going to be and it's probably going to be here or Atlanta will serve as a catalyst a catalyst the match that lights the fire for everything else that black people need to do I think my move to Detroit or Atlanta whichever one it's going to be I believe that that's going to be absolutely what we as a people do next I think that I'm not the only one, but I think I'm one of the major pieces at the end using to bring about that great African global renaissance. Being engineered from divine mind. And although we have to work, pay attention to make sure we're following destiny so that we achieve what it is they have marked for us to achieve. Yeah. That would be powerful, man. Um, you said pan Africanism, man. You you really think it's dead or you, they're dying? You kinda of feel like you're the last uh, of a dying breed or what? Well no. It's pan Africanism or perish. So what I meant by okay. that was Oh or perish, okay, okay. Or nice. yeah, okay. or perish. Okay, I misheard you. Or perish. Okay. All right, the uh final uh thing that we got for him uh for umar man just getting to know him uh so like i said we got a chance to get to know the doctor we're going to get to know umar a little bit more personally uh so let's start this off man do you have any special talents other than being an orator i'm a writer i've been told i'm a very good writer in fact i want to do more of that and probably will once the school comes into existence I'm also a little comedian, too. So those will probably be my three talents, and they all have to do with communication. So communication is my talent, I guess. All right. What are your hobbies? Reading, writing, sleeping, eating, watching scary movies, and hanging out. All right. Can't go wrong with that, man. Uh, Do you have any fears? Yes, the only fear that I have is that I will die having not made it full struggle. That's the only fear. All right. Any regrets in your life? Yes, I think I procrastinated in a lot of areas of my life. 
And if I can do it, all, I would have been a lot more focused during my 20s than I was. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite places you visited? Tough question, because I like everywhere I go. I've never been poorly received anywhere. I get tremendous amount of love everywhere. So that would be the question, but I will say above all places, I love being home in the mother country. And it doesn't matter which country. More. Okay. What's your favorite meal? My favorite meal. I love fish. And I love soul food size. Mac and green. <laughs> macaroni and cheese. Greens. Deviled eggs. Black eyed peas. You know, uh, yams. I love soul food size. But I'm a fish lover. And ribs is on the plate. I'm going to kill them, too. All right. What is your biggest pet peeve? My biggest pet peeve is people coming into my life, claiming that they want to help me build. They want to just use me to improve their own image or their company or their business, you know, um, or just to be around for whatever reason. You know, so many people come to me who are not sincerely interested in the work. Yeah. They just want to use the work to serve their own ends, but they're not interested in the work. And that has been one of my biggest uh, challenges that I've had to deal with ever since I've developed an international reputation. All right. What is the biggest lesson you learned in life? The biggest lesson that I've learned in life is at the end of the day, no matter I or don't try. It is up to God to crown the accomplishment and not you. What is to be will be, and what is not to be will not be. And you must offer whatever you do to determine whether or not it will be a successful or failure. In other words, you got to divorce work. And those who cannot divorce the ego from their work would never be at peace. And one of the things that keeps me at peace is I'm able to divorce my ego from my work. I do as much as I can. And then I say, that's all you be at peace with it. All right. And what are you most thankful for? To still have all of my original family members alive on the planet with me all my brothers and sisters my children nieces and nephews I'm thankful to have family that cares about you because at the end of the day no one else will ever care about you the way family does yeah that's amazing alright that basically uh, well I, I asked one thing since we uh, in the Detroit uh, man just what do you like the most about Detroit, man, that uh, you're just considering having a school there? I like the grassroots in it, the very blue collar. Pull up your sleeves and let's help each other. Pull up your sleeves and let's clean up. Detroit is not a bougie city. It has bougie people in it, but it's not a bougie city, not from what I can see. Yeah, Detroit seems like a very grass through laid back we do the best we can we're not really trying to impress nobody of course you got elements simply speaking i don't think the collective consciousness of detroit is a bling bling city i see it as a work hard we do our best we don't have everything but we do the most we can with everything we do have and to me that is very very uh, much in alignment with who i am you know, a non-materialistic, grassroots, get back to the basics, let's help each other get ahead type Think about when I think about Detroit. All right, that's what's up, man. Uh, I pretty much just wrapped up the show. Uh, you know, before we get ready to close this out, I'll leave you with the last words, man. But uh just want to thank you personally, man, for just taking the time. Because uh, this podcast, man, we've been doing about, 
two years now. Uh, I think in January it'd be two years. But uh, brothers, you taking this time, man, because I've been trying to get some interview with some other people. Uh, you know, they asking me, man, how much money you got? You got to pay me and all this other stuff to get these interviews in, man. So just you just taking the time out your day, not asking for a dollar or a cent. You just giving your time, man. I just really appreciate it. So no problem. And, um, there's no Dr. Umar Johnson will be speaking here in Detroit years. The seven Kwanzaa Imani. We will be dealing with the concept of faith be at the Northwest Activity Center in Detroit on January the 1st, 6 p.m. Doors open up at 4 p.m. can be purchased at the door or on drumarjohnson.com. It's going to be a powerful message. And hopefully at that New Year's lecture, I will be announcing where the first school will be. So it's going to be a very historical night here in Detroit on January the 1st. Yeah. Uh, well, let me ask you too. Uh, you know, you were talking about the school. Uh, you know, there was talks with you wanting to have a uh, school for the girls too. Um, it was it the Anna Douglas, uh... Amy Garvey. Oh, okay, yeah, and uh, yeah. Uh, is there? Do you, yeah. Uh, do you have a like certain time frame yet, or have you just, just been well, so busy with FDMG? Well, depending on the building or? that we get. Okay. It has not been ruled out that the school won't be covered. That has not been ruled out. If we end up with a large building that can accommodate enough classes for boys and girls, then the school may very well be co-ed from the beginning. Okay. Can't beat that at all. But yeah, uh, so always I just like to give a, uh, shout out, uh, they're not here with me today, uh, but my crew, uh, Darnell and Tyler, uh, then stick with me with, uh, stick with me on the show. Um, I had to do this interview, so they weren't on here. But uh, we're going to be back uh, next week just to talk some more sports, uh, just what's going on in the sports world. Uh, but I had to get this guy on, man. This guy's uh, making a name for himself out there, trying to get stuff done. So had to get this brother some airtime. Um, yeah, Umar, uh, any other final thoughts or anything else to say before we close this out, man? Uh, no, sir. Thanks for the interview. Glad to be in Detroit. I love the energy. This might be my new home, and we're going to find out if it's going to be on January the 1st. So we want everybody to come on out. Children are free. Elders are also free. Yep. So we have that posted in the description. And uh, just be out on the lookout for this uh, interview. You can check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher. Uh, it's going to be up everywhere. Just hit up Don't Kill the Messengers podcast, and uh, this will be up. So as always, I uh, appreciate you all for listening. Peace out.